Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So we are continuing verse 10 of Surah As-Sajda and the verse 10 which we had recited and which we have mentioned last day. It states, and they say, and they say, when we are dead and become lost in the earth, shall we indeed be recreated anew? Now this is the last verse on page 660. What you have today is 661, and the top paragraph just begins to explain that verse. So the verse was that they were saying the unbelievers, when we are dead and we become lost in the earth, shall we be indeed recreated anew? Shall we be recreated again? Allah says nay, but they deny the meeting with their Lord. So as it is mentioned at the beginning of 661, this is the statement of the unbelievers of Makkah who deny the resurrection after death. On one occasion, they came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and derisively remarked, when we have been destroyed and our bones and flesh have been mixed up with the earth or the dirt of the earth, until it has vanished and no distinction can be made, will we be re recreated or will we be created in a new creation and return to life for a second time? And this was one of the questions that nearly all those people had, eh? those people to whom the prophets in the past came. From the very beginning, this recreation and giving life back to the dead, it is known as al-ba'ath, resurrection. Al-ba'ath, ba'd al-maut, the life after death or the resurrection after death. The resurrection obviously means when one is resurrected, back to become alive. From the very beginning, people could not believe in that except that they believed in Allah. A person who does not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's very difficult for them to believe this. And those who do not believe in Allah and they believe that there is some sort of thing that will happen after you die, then they will call it by different names, whether it is, whether it is reincarnation or transmigration of the soul. They believe in these things, but not resurrection. That's not resurrection. That's not coming back to life and being accountable to Allah for the deeds that a person has done. And this resurrection is that, it's not that when a person passes away, his soul is taken away and then infused in the body of another thing, of another being. No. The soul goes back directly into that same body that it was in on the face of the earth. So the body and the soul coming together will be resurrected, not the soul alone. Questioning will not be to the soul alone on the day of judgment. Punishment will not be to the soul alone on the day of judgment or in the hereafter. But it is the aqidah of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'at that when a person is placed in the grave, it states, that the returning of the soul to the body, thus producing a type of life, is the truth. So therefore, if there is punishment in the grave, both the body and the soul will feel that. Just like how we feel it in this world, the soul and the body, we feel the pain. Everything is united. Obviously, that life is a different type of life. It is not a life where we will need oxygen to breathe. It is not a life where we will need food or water to live on. It is not a life that we will need some sort of ventilation bringing air to to ourselves when we are in the grave, that's a totally new, different life. And the only way we can really understand that is when we go there. <laughs> you know, but that is the haq, that is the truth. That is the truth. The Prophet wasallam was given the knowledge of this and all the Anbiyas were given the knowledge of this, that there is life in the grave. And when you are dead, it's not that the body becomes deco uh, decayed and decomposed. It starts to rot away. It mixes with the dirt and the sand. And this was the question these people had. They say, are you telling us that when we are dead 
and our bodies become lost in the earth because the earth starts to eat the flesh. The bone starts to, the bone starts to dis disintegrate and it starts to mix up in the earth that it's very difficult to identify what is in the earth, the particles of those things. So now they are thinking that when we are lost about, how can we become back? How can we come back alive? How can we, how can we be recreated anew, like in a new shape, a new form? And this is what the question was about. But they were asking the question not really to find out. You know, there are many ways you can ask the question. Sometimes you ask the question to see if the person knows that is not good in Islam. Sometimes you can ask a question to show a person that you know better than him. That is not acceptable in Islam. Sometimes you can ask a question to mock a person. That is also not good in Islam. The only time you should ask a question is when you want to find out something that will bring knowledge to the person. That is the only reason. Salam, this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said on one occasion, those who ask questions of the ulamas in order to show that they are more knowledgeable or to show ranks above the johala and those people who do not have knowledge, then they will not be able to smell the fragrance of paradise even though its scent can be achieved to a distance of 500 years away from paradise. Why? Because questions of this nature has a bit of takabur pride in it, arrogance, haughtiness, trying to look down upon a person, ridiculing a person, mocking a person. And those things are totally haram in Islam. Allah says, ask. But he says, first, alu ahla dhikri in kuntum la ta'alamun. When you do not know a thing, ask so you will get to know. Not that if you know and you want to prove something. Not that you want to show up, you know, one person wants to show up himself in front of other people. That is a, that has a bit of takabur and pride in it. You know, so therefore, they were not asking this question really to find out if there was indeed resurrection. Or if it, if it is so, you know, it's like they come to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and say, you know, we have been hearing about this. Tell us, is it truth? The truth? They were not asking it in this main manner. They were asking it, you know, in a manner to mock him. And says, what sort of thing you are saying? You know, uh, when we are dead, we will come back to life. Who says that? Who can prove that? Who would that happen to? You know, in this way, trying to ridicule him and mock him. On account of this statement and question, Allah informed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about their beliefs and said, Nay, but they deny the meeting with their Lord. So immediately, Allah does not bring any proof to show that that will happen. No. He does not bring evidences from the past people to show that that will happen or reveal any ayah concerning the matter of the hereafter. Why? Because if any of those things have been revealed to these people, it will be useless because from the beginning they are not believing at all. So why try to waste your time, so to say, and explain things when from in front they are not explaining? They, meaning that they are not accepting. They do not believe. So Allah says, O oh Prophet, they deny the meeting with Allah. They deny that they will die and go back to Allah. They deny they will be returned to Allah. So if they deny the first fundamental thing, which is the return to Allah, then will they believe something that comes afterwards? Resurrection comes after meeting Allah, after returning back to Allah. So this is why the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is told by Allah that, O oh Prophet, these people do not believe at all. They deny the meeting of Allah. Regarding this statement, the commentators have stated here the verse shows that they are not denying Allah's power and ability to recreate. They are not denying that. Instead, they are denying their return to Allah. It's two separate things. You know, it's like if they come and they would ask, can your Lord recreate us? That's a different question. 
but they, this was not their focus this was not their intention they were just trying to mock the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam ridicule him while they held a disbelief about returning back to allah so they believed that there was no reckoning and accounting to allah they believed that clearly and that they will not meet Allah as it is recorded in Tafsir Al-Qurtubi. They did not have that belief at all. In response to their denial, Allah ordered the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to say to them. So therefore, answers are given with respect to the way the questions are asked. And answers are given also with respect to the nature of the people asking the question also how they are quest answers are given how they would ask the questions what sort of beliefs they had about a certain thing you know and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give an answer to the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam about that so in order to te teach them a lesson and tell them that one day you will witness the same thing that you are denying with your own eyes you will see it and you will feel it. Allah said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, O oh Muhammad, say to them, the angel of death who is set over you will take your souls and then you shall be brought back to your Lord. So you are denying your return to Allah, but one day you will see that. You will see that the angel of death who has been entrusted to you and who has been placed over you, he will come and he will take your souls. So this that you are denying, it will become a reality. There is no, you know, there is no reason to prove, you know, about anything. You know, it's sometimes, you know, if you are speaking to a person and the person tends to deny and not believe in you, and you are telling him something will happen, then you will say, rather than wasting your time to prove the point, just tell him, listen, brother, when that happens, you will see for yourself. When that happens, you will see for yourself. You know, so it's like these people who deny the resurrection, deny the life in the grave, deny all these things. It's just Allah is saying to them, you will see for your own self when the angel of death comes for your soul. Here they are told that the resurrection is real and the returning will take place. There is no doubt about that. Every single person who denied it, they returned. Those who are denying it will return. And every single man who entered the face of the earth will exit and with and with exiting the face of the earth there is only one place every human being can return to and that is back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there is no other place so whether a man or a person wants to deny it or whether he wants to doubt it whether he wants to gather all the proofs and evidences on the face of the earth to prove there is no resurrection and no returning to Allah he will have to go also he will see it with his own eyes so one day as it states the angel of death will take their souls all of those people and then they would return to allah for judgment reckoning and compensation allah will judge them allah will take their deeds into account they will go through the period of reckoning and then when they go through the period of reckoning then they will be compensated for what they have done good for good and bad for bad those who have done good will reap good and those who have done bad will reap the consequences of their evil and sinful deeds on the face of the earth and this is what allah says then you shall be brought back to your lord so when you reach to allah then you will see what is going to happen there while commenting on this verse hafid ibn kathir writes it is apparent from this verse that the angel of death is one specific being from among the angels. So there are not many angels of death. There is one specific angel of death. He says in some traditions, he is named Israel salam, and this is what is famous. Meaning, according to these traditions that say that his name is Israel, then those traditions are authentic and they are correct. Just as the one angel has the name of Jibril or Jibrail, and one he has the name of Mikael, so to this angel, his name is Israel. 
the angel of death. It is recorded in a hadith that the angel of death has helpers. At the time of death of an individual, the helpers extract the soul from the entire body and when it reaches to the truth, the angel of death takes it, as recorded by Hafiz ibn Kathir in his Tafsir al-Qur'an al-Azim. That the helpers, because, you know, I mean, this is what, this will explain to us and the other passages will explain to us, you know, how is it that thousands of people can die and there is one angel of death taking their souls? You know, one after the other. Now, who knows whether they really die at one time? Now, for us, things happen so quick that we think that things may happen at one time, like within one second. But remember that one second is made up of a lot of points. Point one, point two, point three. But to us, it occurs as if it is one time. But for the angel of death, it's just a swift move, which is point something of a sec second, and he has already recovered a thousand souls. But for the human beings now, they will look to see that probably two people die at the same time, but it's not like that. In the invisible world, probably it might not be the same time. You know, so it is different times, and even if it is the same times, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, He has placed everything in order, in an arrangement, in a manner where the angels have their jobs to do and it is done in a manner that conforms to the wishes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The angels cannot delay from a time that Allah has specified one death. The angels cannot, cannot delay on that. Nor can the angel take the soul of a person before its due time. Angels will, the angel of death will never do that, and the angel of death cannot do that. It is also narrated that the great exegete of the Holy Quran, Qatada alayhi rahmah, said, said, It is the angel of death who takes the life, that's the soul. He alone does that, and with him are helpers from among the angels. As recorded in Tafsir at Tabari, that's Ibn Jarir at Tabari. So only one person who is known as the angel of death, he alone takes that soul. No other angel has the power to take out the soul from the body. But what the other angels will do is remove the soul from the body, the, hu the human body. Because the, 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 it's like if the soul has in, been infused and penetrated into every fiber of the human body. So wherever the soul is, there is life. You know, straight down to the toes. The angels who are the helpers, they begin to rip the soul out. You know, if the person was an evildoer and he doesn't want to give up his soul. In fact, the Holy Quran states when the angel of death comes, he gives the order to the person, Akhriju and Fusakum, give up your soul. Give it up. So therefore, sometimes people do not want to give it up because they see the angel of death. And they know it's the last moment of their life. And they are scared and they are frightened and they do not want to die. So it says that it states in the hadith that the soul starts to run in different parts of their body. Taking refuge in the body, not wanting to come out. It's like if the man does not want to give himself up, but the soul is running in different parts of the body to hide. And that's where the angels who are there begin to beat him, the Quran says. وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ بَاسِتُ أَيْدِيهِمْ And the angels are stretching their hands. يَضْرِبُونَ وُجُوهُهُمْ وَأَدْبَارَهُمْ Beating them on their faces and their backs. The angels begin to beat them. The Prophet ﷺ said, The beatings, the beating of the angels leave such marks that all the creation of Allah can see those marks except jinn and men. They cannot see that. But all the other makhluk can see the beating of the angel. Why? To do what? And then eventually the angel rips the soul from the body. And they go with it. But as for a believer, he obeys the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when the angel of death presents uh, himself in front of that individual, he willingly gives up his soul. 
you know, to the angel of death. So the angel starts to move the soul out from all the different parts of the body. If you have seen a person dying, you will find different parts of his body becomes lifeless. You know, one limb comes life lifeless, the other limb comes lifeless, you know, and there might still be some hoosh or consciousness within the person, but parts of the body, it's becoming lifeless. The soul is being taken out from that part. And the final thing is that the soul is now pulled out from the mouth. When the soul is pulled out according to the hadith, when the soul is extracted through the mouth, it goes up and the eyes begin to look at the soul. This is why many a time a dying person dies with the, dies with the eyes open, looking towards as the soul comes out from his body. When it reaches to the throat, when it reaches there, then all the angels leave it right there, the other angels, the helpers, and they leave that job for only the angel of death who will take it from there and carry it back to wherever Allah wants it to go. So this is why it is stated that he has the angel of death has uh, the what uh, helpers, but he is the one who has been deputed for that job of taking out the souls of the human beings. While speaking of the case, the ease which has been given to the angel of death in taking lives, while speaking of the ease which has been given to the angel of death in taking lives, yani how easy it is, how easy it is, person will say, to take so much souls from the body every day and so, you know, so often and one after the other, that might be a, a big task for someone. That is our understanding. But in explaining this, Mujahid, alayhi rahma, said, the earth has been guarded for the angel of death. The earth has been guarded for the angel of death. It has been made like a tray for him. The whole earth is like a tray in front of him. He takes from it from wherever he wishes. So if you have a tray in front of you with many different things, then you have total control of taking anything at any time you wish. It's there at your disposal. So the whole world, the earth, is like a tree in front of the angel of death, subhanAllah. It's like a tree. And when there is a, the order from Allah to take the soul, the angel of death looks, the angel of death looks right there and he takes out the soul. Takes out the soul. It's, it's as easy for him like that. It's not difficult for him at all, as it is mentioned in Tafsir At-Tabari. Having mentioned that the angel of death having mentioned about the angel of death and that he is deputed to take the souls of men Surah As-Sajda goes further, further in verse 12 to describe the state of the wrongdoers on the day of judgment so the angel of death will take the souls and then the angel of death when he extracts the soul what does the angel of death do with the soul? The angel of death does not carry it anywhere. The angel of death places it in the hands of angels. From the highest heaven to the presence of Allah, straight down to the face of the earth. The hadith recorded by Imam Ahmad states that the angels form lines coming down to that body. And when the soul is taken out, the angel of death places the soul into the hands of the other angels. For a believer, the authentic tradition says, for the believer, a special coffin and shrouding comes from Jannat. Soft like silk, scented with musk from Jannat. And when the soul is taken out by the angel of death, it is placed into the soft silk cloth, which is the shroud that is scented. And the angels, and that soul gives off a very sweet scent. And the angels handle that soul with utmost care, carrying it from with one hand. Yani one hand, the angels are taking it from hand to hand, passing it with ease and with respect. And every time that soul goes up, it gives off such a sweet scent. The other angels who accompany those angels say, who is this? Which, whose soul is given off such a sweet scent? And then it is said, Fulan ibn Fulan, he is so and so, the son of so and so. And it is taken straight up to Allah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it reaches in the presence of Allah, Allah gives the order, write down 
write down the name of my servant in the gate of Eliyin or in the books that has the names for those people who will go in Eliyin, the highest Jannah and paradise. And then his soul, when that is done, the soul comes back to the body and by the time the soul comes back to the body, the body is already in the grave. Where the soul meets the body now, here is where Munkir and Nakir present themselves. But when the soul is that of an evildoer, unbeliever, wicked man, a sinner, transgressor, then, as I said before, he doesn't want to give up his soul, so the angels rip it out from the body. They rip it out from the body. And subhanallah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam described that act of the ripping of the soul of the body. He says at that time the man feels as if he had been stroked and he had been hit and struck or beaten with 70 to 80 wounds of a sword on his body. And uh, the soul is ripped apart and the soul gives off such a bad stench. The angels do not want to hold it. A coarse, rough cotton cloth is brought from hell for him. And his soul is taken from the body and flung into that cloth, not held by the hands of the angels. And they keep on flinging it from, from uh, you know, uh, cloth to cloth or from hand to hand. It isn't the coarse cloth. You know, so the cloth is being flung now from hand to hand and they just don't want to keep it. And every time the soul passes a group of angels, the angels say, whose dirty and putrid soul is this? Giving off such a dirty stench. Whose soul is this? And the angel said, this is so and so, the son of so and so. And then when the soul reaches, it does not even reach up because it gives off such a bad stench. From the heavens, Allah gives the command. He says, put his name in sigil in the lowest pit of the fire of hell. Put his name in that register. And then the body, subhanallah, the body of an angel, let's say, the soul, sorry. The, the soul of the believer is taken back with respect, with utmost care, straight down to the grave. But subhanallah, the soul of the evildoer and the sinner or the unbeliever is flung from the highest heaven straight down to the grave to meet that body. It's flung straight down. It's not handled by the angels. So that which happens afterwards, sometimes the Prophet ﷺ will tell the Sahabas, if you know what I know, you will cry more, you will weep more and you will laugh less because these are the things that are ahead of us. These are the things that are ahead of us how we'll be treated by the angel of death. What will happen to our souls when it exists from the body, Allah alone knows. In fact, what will happen to us at the time of death, whether we will die as believers or not, Allah alone knows and no man has that knowledge. With the blink of an eye, a person shifts from one state to the other state. With the blink of an eye, shaitan is always there. The pangs of death starts and shaitan is still making his last effort to see he can make a believer into an unbeliever. So speaking about the angel of death coming and taking the soul and the soul returns back to Allah, the next stage after that, it is the presence before Allah, it is going before Allah, it is the day of judgment after resurrection, this is the next main stage. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he spoke about this in verse 12 and he says, And if you could only see, and if you only could see when the mujrimoon, mujrimoon from the word jurm, which has the meaning of criminal, disbeliever, sinners, there are different levels of a mujrim, you know, the one who is the biggest criminal, who is a kafir, who is an unbeliever, who is a mushrik, then you might have people who are believers, but they are sinners, they are transgressors, that is also jurm. They are committing, committing acts of transgression. So all of them will fall into the word Mujrimin. If you can only see how they shall hang their heads in shame before their Lord. Allah has revealed this ayah to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Saying to the Prophet, if you could only see the miserable plight of these sinners, 
And these unbelievers, how they will be hanging their heads before their Lord in shame and humiliation. And they will be saying to Allah, Oh our Lord, we have now seen and heard. Now we see, subhanAllah. Now we see what we were being told on the face of the earth. Now we hear what we were being told about on the face of the earth. So send us back to the world, O oh Allah. This will be their cry. O oh Allah, O oh our Lord, we have now seen and heard, so send us back to the world. If you send us back to the world, what will we do? We will do righteous good deeds, O oh Allah. Now there is the crying and the, you know, the petitioning that goes on. They will petition Allah and they will make all these statements in front of Allah. Verily, we now believe with certainty. Verily, he said, now, now we believe just like Firaun. When he was in the state that Jibreel salam was ordered by Allah to destroy him, he says, no, now I believe in the Lord of Moses and Aaron. Here Allah tells man that if he could only see the state of the transgressors and wrongdoers in front of their Lord on the day of judgment, then he will be totally saddened and startled at the nature of their disgrace and humiliation and will be terrified and frightened at, the, at this state. You know, in verse 12 there, the verse starts by saying, if you could only see. Now, the commentators and exegetes of the Holy Quran have explained this word, who is the addressee? Who is being addressed here? Allah has revealed the Quran to, first of all, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay? So therefore, when the word is said, you know, the imperative tense is used, and the word you is normally incorporated in the imperative tense, like where Allah says, Qul, ya ayyuhal kafirun. Say, O unbelievers. So who, who the order is given to? The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that Allah is saying, O Prophet, O my Prophet, you say to them, Qul, hu wallahu ahad. You say to them, Allah is one. All these different things. So when the address is given, you, first of all, it refers to the Prophet ﷺ. But in this case here, commentators have stated, yes, it refers, the address is there to the Prophet ﷺ, but the address is also there to the people. And Allah is telling the people that all these people are disbelieving every day. You see that, that they are dying. You see that in their state, in their state uh, on the face of the earth, they are disbelieving, but yet they seem to be so happy. Allah says, if you could only see on the day of judgment what will happen to them, you will really be sad to see their plight. So in that way, the address is. Allah is saying to human beings, all these people that die one by one in front of you, the mushrikeen and the kuffar, those people who are involved in so many wrongdoings, and yet they seem to be enjoying life, well, if you see them there, you will know that they will not really enjoy in life. They will go in deeper and deeper in the azab of Allah. So the address is in this way. Oh man, if you could only see the state of the transgressors and wrongdoers in front of their Lord on the day of judgment, on the day of judgment, then he, man, will be totally saddened and startled at the nature of their disgrace and humiliation. And this man will be terrified and frightened at his sight, so frightened that if he was given a chance to live on after seeing that, he wouldn't do anything that those wrongdoers will do. He will take a lesson from it. As it is mentioned in Safat Tafasir, what will be the state? The heads of these wrongdoers shall be hanging in shame. And they shall cry unto their Lord, begging for a chance to come back to the world. That will be the cry on the day of judgment. The cry of everyone on the day of judgment shall be, oh Allah, send me back to the world. Send me back to the world. Then they will, reality, they will understand, people will understand the reality of how valuable the world was in doing good deeds to prepare for the life hereafter. In that respect, how valuable it was. Some scholars have mentioned that in the above verse, the address is given to the Prophet wasallam, saying that if he could only see the state of the disbelievers in front of their Lord on the day of judgment, then he will surely witness their woeful plight. In other words, subhanAllah, it says, it's the address is like this. 
that Allah is saying to the Prophet, O Prophet of Allah, they deny you every day. They mock you. They use statements against you. They persecute you. But if you could only see what will happen in them on the day of judgment, you will see how they will suffer the consequences of their deed, how they used to ridicule you, how they used to mock you, how they used to taunt you, you will see. So in that way, the address is given now. If you could only see them, then you will know, you know, what will be their state in the hereafter, their destructive plight. Some scholars have also stated that in the verse, the Prophet ﷺ has been commanded to tell the unbelievers that if they could only see how they, the unbelievers, will be hanging their heads in disgrace in front of their Lord on the day of judgment, then they will be ashamed of what they are presently doing by committing kufr and shirk as is recorded in Tafsir al-Qurtubi. So the third address now, the third explanation, the third explanation is this and all are incorporated in the verse. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he's speaking to the human beings and also it is a lesson for those people, you know, that the address is being made about them. So what is the third explanation interpretation is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is ordered to tell these unbelievers that if you could only see what will be your state on the Day of Judgment, you wouldn't do what you are doing. It's a very beautiful commentary. If you could only see, if you are given a glimpse of how you will be hanging your heads in shame, tasting the punishment of Allah, and you will be crying then to come back in the world then you will appreciate these few days you are given in the world and you will not do what you are doing so on the day of judgment and in front of allah the unbelievers will be bending and lowering their heads on account of regret disgrace grief humiliation and sorrow they will be sorrowful they will be humiliated they will be grieving they will regret the way they live their lives. And some believers also will be regretting based on their state in the hereafter. In this state, they will call on Allah and say, Oh, our Lord, we have now seen the truth which we used to deny. Subhanallah. Why wait until that time when we know what will happen? They will say, We have now seen the truth which we used to deny. We have now heard that which we used to reject. We now believe in your promise and we now accept your messengers. So please send us back to the world so that we may do good deeds. For certainly we now believe with firmness and we have certainty that your promise is the truth. Subhanallah. Allahu Akbar. What tone of voice they will be using to Allah. Allah is so merciful and compassionate but he wouldn't give anybody a chance. Because in this world he gives man a long chance. A man has all the things on the face of the earth and he still disobeys Allah and Allah still gives him more. Allah gives him a chance. Every day he lives a life of disobedience and he does not pay attention to the fact that one day he will leave everything behind and go back to Allah. But that day will come. That day will come when he will be standing before Allah and he will be begging for the chance. And Allah will say to him, did I not give you sufficient long life? that you could have prepared for this day. In this pitiful state, the unbelievers will make promises. They will pledge to believe in the oneness of Allah. And they will give the undertaking that they will not worship anyone besides Allah. They will make the promise there. Although they had made that promise before they entered the face of the earth, when they were just in the world of souls, all of us made that promise. So they came on the face of the, they forgot that promise and then they will remember it again in the hereafter. So they will now make a lot of promises to Allah. They will actually give an undertaking that they will not worship anyone besides Allah. They will be saying, oh Allah, if you only send us back, we will believe in you alone and we will worship you alone. This, however, will only be a word from the mouth without any truth in it. The reality is that if they were to be sent back to the world, they will not do any good deeds and will return to kufr and shirk 
about this Allah says in Surah Al-An'am, but if they will return to the world, will, they will certainly revert to that which they were forbidden. And indeed, they are liars. Allah is telling us in this world what they will be saying. And he also tells us that in their statement on the day of judgment, they will be liars. They put no meaning to it. There is no truth in it. They just say this to get out of a problem. As it is mentioned before, we mentioned the ayats, the commentary when they are in the midst of oceans, surrounded by death. Then they make promises to Allah, but when they get on the shore, they go back to their shirk and the kufur. So Allah says, they are liars. They will not really, if they were to come back, they wouldn't do any good deeds. Surah Sajda continues in verse 13 and states, and if we had willed, if we had willed, surely we would have given every person his guidance. If we had willed, Allah is saying, then surely we would have given every person his guidance. In other words, Allah is saying, if we would have willed, if we had willed, everybody could have been a believer on the face of the earth. And there were no disbelievers, Allah says. If that was our intention, that could have happened. Nothing is difficult for Allah. He says, but the word from me took effect that I will fill hell with jinn and mankind together. But the word from me took effect. In other words, from the time I said something and uttered something, then that must come to pass because Allah does not go against his words. When that word took effect, when did that happen? In the very beginning, in the very beginning, when shaitan was cast out of Jannah and he was known as a rajim the accursed one, he said to Allah, as it is mentioned in the Holy Quran, he said to Allah, Oh Allah, now you have expelled me from paradise and you are going to send me to the fire of hell. And your curse has come upon me. I ask you for wanting. I ask you to grant me respite and grant me life until the end of the world. Allah said, Grant it because you already destined for the fire of hell. Having a long life wouldn't save you. That is Allah's promise. When he got that chance, see how sly and how tricky he was. When he got that chance, now he knows Allah will not go against his word. So Allah will not give him the chance to live forever until the day of judgment and then pull it back and say, okay, no, I'm not going to do that again. Inna Allah la yukliful mi'ad. Allah does not ever go against his word and promise. Shaitan then said, now that you have granted me respite, I promise you that I will try to misguide every one of your servants on the face of the earth. And you will find not many of them worshipping you and being obedient to you. This is what I'll do. He was challenging Allah. This is what he promised. Allah says, you can go and you can try and do what you want. But as for my servants, my ibadi, you have no sultan, you have no authority over them. They will never fall into your trap. Then Allah said, but as for you and your army, and as for those people who decide and choose to follow you from among men and jinn, I am telling you, I will fill Jahannam with all of you. That is the word that came from Allah at that time. That word is the word that came from Allah. And from that, those who follow shaitan, those who take to kufr and belief, the word has already been established that Jahannam is for them and has been prepared for them. So, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here. Allah informs mankind that if he had willed, he could have given guidance to every person without anyone having to choose it on his own. I mean, as it is, people have a choice to make with respect to iman or kufr. They have a choice to make, whether good or bad. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not left us on our own. But he has given us uh, intelligence. He has given us uh, good reasoning. He has given us abilities to recognize with our intelligence and our powers of reasoning to recognize what is good and what is bad. 
And with that, we are expected to accept the truth. With that, we are expected to do that which is good. That is what Allah has placed. So Allah has given us the necessary tools for us to accept guidance. Allah has given. Allah has shown us the way. Allah has shown us the way by sending scriptures, by sending ambiyas on the face of the earth, by revealing so many different signs, by having done so many miracles on the face of the earth. Allah has put everything there as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Inna hadaynahu sabila, imma shakiran wa imma kafura. We have already shown man, man the right path. It is for him to either adopt the right path or the wrong path. It's for him now. So Allah has Allah guides whomsoever he wishes, but he has given that choice to man. So if we believe, we will be blessed for that. And if anyone disbelieves, he will be punished for that because that will be his choice that he's making. So therefore, if Allah had so wished and will, he could have given guidance to every person without anyone having to choose it on his own. However, this was against his wisdom. Since he wanted man to accept faith or iman on his own willingly and voluntarily. He wanted man to do that. So that when man does that, he will be rewarded for that. But if you are doing something based on the fact that you have been forced or programmed to do it, then you can't take the compliment for that. Neither can you make any claim for rewards and blessings because you didn't do it. You didn't do it. Somebody made you do it. So Allah wanted man to accept Iman on his own without being forced or compelled to do so. Allah says that his word had already become established and fixed that he will fill hell with sinners and disbelievers from among men and jinn from among jinn and men hence people will be given the choice to accept true faith or reject it so that promise already came from Allah that promise came already from Allah so therefore for the promise to be fulfilled man will be given a choice to choose this or choose that those who accept it will be from among the believers yani those who accept accept faith will be from among the believers who will be granted gardens in paradise as for those who reject faith they will be cast into the fire of hell and will be punished severely this is allah's promise and it will come to pass and it shall come to pass that some people will go to the fire of hell some people will go to paradise who would go here and who would go there that is based on the choice they make on the face of the earth with respect to those who have chosen this belief instead of belief allah says then taste you the torment of the fire then this is the time when they will be made to enter the fire they have made the choice of kufr and shirk they have chosen not to believe in Allah and not to do good deeds. So Allah will say to them on the day of judgment, Taste you the torment of the fire of hell because of your forgetting the meeting of this day of yours. Connect straight back to the question, the, the ayah that was revealed before, that was mentioned in verse 10, when they came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they said, what when we have died and our bones are mixed up in the earth and we we are vanished uh, can we be returned back to life and allah says nay they deny the meeting of the lord so but with respect to that allah says uh, he will say to them taste of the punishment of your lord now because you forgot the meeting with your lord that same meeting you denied now you they are being reminded of that meeting which they had with allah and surely Allah says, we too will forget you. You forgot, on, forgot us on the face of the earth. Well, today we will forget you, show no mercy and compassion to you. And Allah will say to them, we will not even look at you and listen to your cries. So taste you the abiding torment for what you used to do. Taste the permanent fire and punishment in the fire of hell. In an admonishing and rebuking manner, the unbelievers will be told to taste the punishment of the hellfire which they are receiving or which they would be receiving on account of their denial of the hereafter. Allah says, taste you the torment of the fire that is in a reprimanded manner, admonishing them in this way. 
they were so caught up in the worldly life that they totally forgot that they will eventually meet Allah. On account of this, Allah will say to them, surely we too will forget you. You forgot us on the face of the earth. You forgot us on the face of the earth, so today we'll forget you. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a very beautiful ayah in the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Hashr. Ya ayuhalladheena amanu attaqullah wal tanzur nafsum ma qaddamat lighad wa attaqullah inna Allah khabirun bima ta'amaloon. Or those who believe, fear Allah, and let so each soul look towards what it has sent for tomorrow. And fear Allah, for Allah is fully aware of all that you do. But Allah goes further. And He says to the believers, وَلَا تَكُونُوا كَالَّذِينَ نَسُوا اللَّهِ Do not become like those who forgot Allah. Do not become like those who forgot Allah. There were many people in the past and there continue to be many people who will live and forget Allah. Forget the meeting with Allah. Forget the day they will have to be returned to Allah. So those who forget Allah, what will happen to them? Allah says, فَأَنْسَاهُمْ أَنْفُسَهُمْ Allah made them forget their own selves. So they didn't know why they were living. They had no focus and objective in life. They live like animals today for today. So they forgot Allah. Allah made them forget their own selves. So they never thought that one day will die, they, they will die and return to Allah. So therefore, when people behave in that manner and they forget Allah, Allah will say to them on the day of judgment, today we will forget you because you forgot us. But how will Allah forget, the, forget them? It means that Allah will leave them to suffer in the punishment of hell just as they left off iman and good deeds in the world. So they rejected iman and they rejected good deeds. Allah will refuse to help them because Allah literally cannot forget anything. Forgetfulness is connected to human beings. But forgetting them means Allah will not even turn towards them with compassion or mercy. Allah will not even listen to them. He will not even ease their punishment in the fire of hell. No compassion, mercy or kindness will be shown to them. And they will be ordered to suffer in the everlasting punishment for their disbelief and denial. Allah will say to them, taste the eternal punishment for what you used to do. Taste it. Because you used to behave in this manner of denying Allah and disbelieving in Allah, so you will taste the punishment forever and ever. Having mentioned about the unbelievers and their miserable state in the hereafter, in the previous verses, Surah Sajda goes further to mention the believers as well as the great blessings Allah has kept for them in the hereafter. Regarding the true believers and the attributes of the true believers, Allah says in verse 15, only those believe in our signs. Only those believe in our signs who, when they are reminded of them, these signs, they fall down prostrate and glorify the praises of their Lord and they are not proud. Only those people. Subhanallah. Some outstanding attributes of the believers that are given. But Allah ties all these outstanding attributes to one thing, which is called belief. Belief in Allah, belief in the signs of Allah, belief in the revelations of Allah, belief in everything that Allah has sent. Allah says, of all the people, who are those who will sincerely prostrate before Allah? And who are those who will really and truly glorify Allah and praise Him night and day? And those people who will not be proud and arrogant. Who are those people? He says, only those who truly believe in Allah. So it means that anytime a man has true, true sincere belief in Allah, then he will always be inclined towards worshipping Allah. He will always be inclined towards praising and glorifying Allah with the tongue and in the heart and he will never become proud and arrogant. His iman, true iman, stops him from becoming proud and arrogant. He does not become haughty and boastful because of his true iman in Allah. We'll stop there inshallah next week we'll continue.
ليا دنيا الناس بتقسى كل يوم على بعضها ليا دنيا الناس بتنسى يوم رجعها لربها